to invite uh, Sung Hei Lau to come up and, and talk to us. She's got some wonderful announcements for us. Uh, hello. Um, hi. Um, so um, today um, lunch is um, being prepared and it's for um, a project that we're doing with uh, COP US, uh, with COP. And so all the um, uh, money will be going to this COP project um, in, um, I don't know if you guys heard about it, we're going to America, the COP um, from here in the UK to uh, learn about like um, the culture there in America, try to bring it back here and to uh, start up a, um, the cup to get the cup going more here. So um, I don't want to do too much talking because I'm a bad talker. So um, I've, we've got, I've got a video prepared that will show um, what, yeah, it, mean, it is about. Religious leader from Korea is bringing America a bicentennial event of the greatest significance. In 1974, Reverend Moon proclaimed the exciting message of God's hope for mankind. More than 40,000 people crowded Madison Square Garden. Know your worth, know your value, know what you have. Be there for your brothers and sisters. Be there for your parents. Be there for the ones that came before us, the ones that will come after us. Be there for our true parents. We own this together. We change this world together. This trip is to learn from USA CARP and to bring back the know-how and inspiration to the UK. We are going for four days to the CARP convention, including two days outreach training and representing the UK in the BC Sports Festival for the last four days. We don't want this trip to just be a flash in the pan, but a step forward in developing CARP in the UK, reaching into universities and helping those coming back from gap year programs, period. So everyone is invited to our American 50s diner. So please come and enjoy American food and American music and finishing with movie and popcorn. So date and details after love. See you soon. Thank you. So, um, yeah, feel free to come to this American diner we're having. Um, it's f for everybody. And um, also, just a uh, last announcement is that um, lunch today will be um, around £2.50, but that's because it includes dessert. And for kids, it's £1.50 with dessert and free drinks. So, yeah, enjoy. You're a good speaker. What do you mean you're a bad speaker? <laughs> Yeah, um, so children is £1.50, and that comes not only with dessert, but also a drink, whereas adults, yeah, it's £2.50, just 50p more. But if you, you know, if you want to support this, you can pay a little bit more for lunch if you like. After all, it's already really good value, isn't it? Okay, and the next announcement is that the North London, yeah, the North London um, Summer Workshop will be on August 1st at Cleve House, and there's still a few places left yeah, for the kids. Um, and finally, I'd like to invite our pastor, Simon Cooper, up, who has a special treat for us. Good morning, everybody. Um, just want to uh, introduce a couple of people from our congregation uh, and uh, just do a couple of short interviews about some things that people have been doing. So um, I think we're going to do the, the marriage one first because AJ needs to get down to Sunday school. Uh, but I just want to invite Aniko, AJ and Aniko up. If you'd like to come up. Maybe I'll do it down here. Is that right, David? Yeah. So um, recently, um, I know some of you, I don't know if anyone are here, but people from our congregation have taken part in the marriage course. And recently, just last week, AJ and Aniko finished. And I spoke to Aniko on the phone. And 
It's a seven-week course, and I just asked her if she'd like to share something, and AJ said he'd be happy to come up and say as well. So I just wanted Aniko first. Just uh, uh, what was your overall impression ab about the course? Yeah, I can really appreciate the course because I can feel God being present and working through this course. So it's definitely a blessed activity. It's growing, it's big, it's reaching out, and... Um, Basically, it's like they're saying, we have the faith, and you take the benefit. So it's really, really beautiful. Right. And, and maybe each of you, you could just say for you personally, what, what, was, um, what was most significant or special for you? Maybe AJ, do you want to go first? On the course, there's seven different programs. Yeah, it's, it's really well organized. Um, so it's quite, you know, in terms of like going out for a night out, you have for, what is it, seven, eight weeks, you know, and if you're a family, you know, you're a working family, you're getting tax credits, it's even half price, so, you know, it works at like 450 or something, five pounds a night to go out and have actually a, a nice meal. You have little romantic tables with candlelight and little flowers that you take home at night, and you can just have a nice kind of two hours just to sit down together, so that's the kind of external part, but I think the way it's structured is that practically there's lots of really good tips. Um, you know, there's lots of stuff there for you to take away in terms of just, you know, exercises to work on, so-called homework, or they call it uh, marriage time. You go back and you can kind of do these exercises at home. Um, but there's also that kind of spiritual element because they don't kind of push the God thing too much, but it's always there kind of in the background. They always end with something that's a little bit deeper that you can also take away. Um, yeah, I think for me that the most significant thing is the fact that, you know, obviously we're a big family, so even just to have two hours or whatever it is, just to sit down and have FaceTime, even though you're doing some reading and you know, you're listening to testimony, but it's just nice to sit, I think, opposite each other for those two hours and actually, you know, that's something we kind of, that's a challenge in itself for us. So I think that in itself is even worth it. Right. How about you, what was, what was significant for you? Yeah, the atmosphere that they create is really helpful to actually tuned into those issues and yes we're not doing so so well in terms of communicating so it did facilitate facilitate a lot better communication between us we can do of course we, we're still quite limited but in that atmosphere we can do better and I think we can improve from it yeah. thank you Annika and uh, do you want to give them a round of applause thank you AJ thanks great thanks so, if there are any married couples here who, who want to put their hand up and say you've got perfect communication? Yeah? No, it's, it's always a journey, isn't it? Communication in a marriage. And so, next, tomorrow, there is a, at the, where the place where they were doing the course, at Onslow Square in South Kensington, there's a marriage party, uh, and you can go along, and they'll have drinks and the band, and there'll be a talk about the course, uh, like a snapshot of the course um, and just want to encourage those of you who, who might be in a situation to go uh, to think about that um, and maybe try it out um, and then I wanted to just speak to one more person from our congregation I, I don't know if you noticed in the email I sent out I asked you to pray for what Marshall and Waite are doing they had an event yesterday so I just wanted to ask Marshall a couple of questions about what he did yesterday and why he was doing it so do you want to give him a round of applause just to encourage him to come up? So, Marshall, you, you had an event yesterday with Wait, uh, and I think it was the, at the end of a program that you've been doing. So, could you just tell us in a nutshell what it was about? Um, since the 1st of April, Wait UK, in partnership with four other organizations, ran a project called uh, Developing Talents and char Developing Character and Talents. It was about character education and then using the performing arts, which it does, uh, to get a message across of abstinence and purity and also uh, healthy living and so on. So uh, yesterday was the climax of, of the project. We started at the Westminster Academy on the 1st of April, but then they cut the program from two hours to one hour because they said the children were tired after a long day. So then we carried on at the Yar Center, which is off Harrow Road, very nice uh, multicultural 
Arts Center there. And, uh, and we, we were doing for the last eight weeks a three-hour session. So the first hour was character education, including things like uh, healthy relationships, uh, healthy eating, uh, being consistent in what you do, those kind of, every, uh, myself and, and Naomi and Fahad and Ashley uh, gave different presentations each, each week. And then uh, afterwards they had a two-hour training, uh, uh, street dance and drama. We had a very good uh, drama teacher, an MA at university, and you know, she, was, she was very good. And yesterday we concluded it with, with I have to say, with the MP, it was Karen Buck, she was an MP from Westminster North. She came and presented certificates. And also the youth MP for Westminster, she came and gave a little talk. It was her first public event, and she, was, she, was, she felt very honored to be there. Great. Thank you, Marshall. And just the other question I really wanted to ask you is, as a unificationist, you know, why, do, why do you do it? Wait. Yes. And all the stress and <laughs> all that it involves. Why? Why would you? you know? Uh, actually, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I, I felt very stressful yesterday for, for many different reasons because actually weight keeps me going. And uh, as Kathleen and others will know, I mean, I started weight because uh, I met the American team in 2002, uh, 2004 rather, and I was so inspired by their message and their spirit of serving and so on. So after, and that's why I brought weight here in 2005. And I've kept it going, I think, for two reasons. One is, um, as a unificationist, you know, we believe in, uh, in the principle, and we believe in, 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 you know, in living a life of abstinence and purity and preparing for marriage and the blessing. So that, that's one reason that weight is going, not just for our church members, which is very important for our youth, but also for the youth outside the church. So we are trying to reach out. Uh, and this particular project, I think we try to... Uh, talk a little bit more about character education, try to talk about how to become a person of good character and looking at the aspects uh, of that. But also, uh, also, second point then, after being a unificationist, you know, um, it's important for me anyway to do some kind of outreach. I might be working and do family things and so on, but it's always important to do something beyond that. And uh, I've always been an outreach person. I've, I've always pioneered like the religious youth service, the British clergy and so on. So uh, wait for me is the, the, the latest, maybe the last and latest thing. <laughs> but it's also for me one, the most important one. And I think, uh, you know, uh, helping, uh, w helping young people to live that kind of life for me is very key. And yes, it is very stressful to organize. We have so many challenges, I won't even go into them. But, uh, but the, the important thing is, is to do the event and to get the support of the MP and the youth MP and as well as the, uh, you know, four other partners. Uh, I, th I think it's really worthwhile doing it. One, one thing that uh, Caroline, the, the dan dance teacher said, she said, you've got some of the best youth ever. She does, a, she does training every day as a professional dancer and drama teacher. And she said, our youth, our weight members, she said, were the best she's ever had. They learn quickly. They are, they're very talented, and also, you know, their, their, their behavior is much better than the street kids. So she, she really appreciated that. So, yeah, to conclude then, you know, I think uh, I'll continue doing this as long as I'm still alive. As long as, uh, you know, if someone can take over in the year or two to come, that would be great, I think, as well. But uh, I'll continue doing weight because uh, I believe in it. And I think, uh, you know, our children are our future. So, you know, I'll keep committing myself to that. Th thank you. Thank you very much, Marshall. Mm. Okay, we'd like to invite the band to come back up. I'd just like to say, personally, I'm really inspired by that, Marshall. It's amazing. He's an amazing person. Um, whenever I hear anecdotes about True Father from the past, um, whenever he would hear about somebody who just spontaneously reached out to the community and just did things like that, I always remember the people's reactions saying, Father was always really inspired. So uh, that put me in mind of that. Thank you, Marshall. So um, we've got a lot more music to come before we uh, hear Simon's message for us today. Um, so if you please rise and let's sing Spring Song of Eden.
So, wasn't that beautiful? Oops. I hope you had a good week, everybody, and uh, hope it's a good moment for you right now, just to, just to be still and to reflect and to, to look inside yourself and to just to look a bit more deeply at where you are right now. Where are you on your journey? You know, in terms of journeys, I never forget a few years ago, about five or six, seven years ago, or eight years, yeah, maybe eight years now, Chieko and I, we used to, um, because of what I was doing in our movement, we were visiting lots of local churches in London and around the country, and often we would drive. And, um, uh, and we would be wanting to get there on time, and, uh, and uh, we were going to places we'd never been to before. And, and we, we often found ourselves a little bit lost and a little bit late, and, and it was kind of stressful. And then one day, one day we bought a sat-nav, and all our problems were solved. And we just sat back and... We were just directed and told by the lady in the machine to turn left here and to go straight on here. And, and uh, it seemed like all our problems were over. We arrived on time and unstressed. Today, everybody relies on a sat-nav, don't they? Sat-nav, don't they? Even if you're not driving, you'll see people walking down the street or you'll see people going... I've got to calibrate, I've got to calibrate. I've got to find out where north is, and, and that's what your phone tells you to do, to do an infinity sign, and then you'll know where north is. Um, but actually, one thing, if you use a sat-nav a lot, and especially when you're driving, that you'll, you'll come to realize that actually you end up knowing very little about the area you're in. Uh, about your surroundings. Um, you'll have no idea about the street parallel and whether there's a shortcut there or a better route. Um, and you'll have no real sense of how you got to where you're going to. You'll arrive at your destination, but you won't really know how you got there. Because actually all you see on your screen is the roundabout right in front of you or the next 50 meters in front of you on the screen. And, um, but we're just happy that someone's there to tell us how to get to where we want to go <coughs> and is directing us. And then, I don't know if you've experienced this, but if you have friends coming to visit who are driving, and you know, I like to say, well, look, when you get to the cost cutter, um, you want to turn right at the lights, and then you just come down, and there'll be a little green triangle, and there's a red pillar box there, post box, and we're just kind of off to the sort of right of it, kind of. Uh, and then we're the first house down Manor Court Road, about 50 yards down, uh, number 49. But people are like, so I, I, can I just have your house number and your postcode, please? <laughs> and a whole human conversation is lost. And it all becomes very military and, and very impersonal. I just need your number and your postcode. They just want your code. They don't want to know about the cost cutter and about the bus stop and, and it's very sad. Another human interaction lost to technology. But, but that's not really what I want to talk about. I mean, the other thing, of course, with the sat-nav is that, you know, it's fun. Uh, we used to, with the kids, we used to put it, the voice, we'd change the voice. You can change it to different languages and we'd put it on Afrikaans. And so you're driving along and you've got this strong Afrikaans voice, or you can put it into you know, Swahili or into, into Korean or Japanese or any language you want and have a bit of fun. Um, but you know, then you have to look at the map, unless you're multilingual. But the point is, you never really get to know about an area. And you put your postcode in, and off you go, and that's it. And maybe that's OK for your car journeys, or for your street journeys, walking along. But actually in life, 
such linear journeys, journeys are, are, are very limited. It's not enough when you look at your life to make journeys in that kind of way. Yes, it's very practical, but um, in our life's journey, we need to know what is going on around us in a broader sense. Otherwise, we'll find that we'll miss the point of our life's journey. You'll miss the point, uh, and you'll realize that when you get to where you thought you were trying to get to. If we are just waiting for a preacher or a teacher or a message from the media to tell us when to turn left, to go straight ahead, then um, I wonder if we'll really discover what we're looking for, if we're just taking directions. And perhaps you're someone who will follow the rules very well, and you'll study very hard, and you'll marry well, and, and you'll, you'll get very blessed, and you'll make your donations, and you'll go to church, and you'll buy a nice house, and you'll, there'll be a nice car outside. And then the message from the world will be, you have arrived at your destination. And that's when you turn the sat-nav off. And it will say, you have arrived at your destination. That's what the world will tell you. And it will freak you out. Because inside you'll feel that, no, I haven't. I can't have. This isn't the end of it. This isn't what it's all about, actually. There's much more. And, but... but that's what happens when we just follow the messages coming from outside us, from the preacher like me or the teacher or, the, or even sometimes the parent or, or the message of the media and the world out there and, and, and what people are telling you life is about. And like I said, you may have all those things and be very popular and be told that you have arrived. But of course inside you will know you haven't. You know why? Because actually this thing that we're trying to get to, this heaven, this concept of heaven, uh, is, is actually it's not about a destination. It's about a quality of heart. It's about a quality in there. It's about a state up here in our mind. A calm state. Um, And, it, and, and what that means, because it's not a place we're just getting to, because it's about a quality and a state, a quality of heart, and a, a state of mind, because it's about those things, is actually about growing. It's about you and I growing our journey. So even if you go through some really tough times, it's actually, it's okay, because it's about growing. And um, we're designed to grow through the different seasons of our life, through the ups, to grow through the ups, and also to grow through the downs. Now, this is where I want to bring in, because the sermon title today is Sat-Navs versus read, Learning to Read a Map, or Reading Maps. And this is where I want to bring in maps, because... The idea today, sitting in the car with a map, an unwieldy big map, obstructing the view of the driver as you sit next to them, seems ridiculous. It kind of almost seems weird. And when my parents get out the map and they start flicking through the pages, I just think, you know, what era are they from? You know, what century are they living in? What would you do it for? I mean... Firstly, most of us, we don't understand maps anymore. We, we, we don't understand um, because we've just got used to that strict and firm voice of the lady telling us when to go straight on. And You know, I don't know if you've ever done this, Marshall, because I, yeah, I know you do a lot of driving, but you decide, I've, I've had enough of this strict lady telling me where to go uh, coming out of the machine, and I'm just going to strike out on my own. I, this route doesn't feel right, but... Immediately, she says, please make a U-turn in one mile. And you, you go, no, I'm going to keep going. She'll stop in the end, and she'll carry on for the second mile. Please do a U-turn at the next exit. 
And I'm going to keep going, and eventually, because you were right, uh, because you actually had a better route, eventually you'll get far enough that doing a U-turn doesn't make sense anymore, and she'll stop. See, the difference with a map is that you can actually explore. And that's one of the purposes of our life. Why God gave human beings freedom is so that we can explore this incredible life that he gave us. And we want our children to explore. We want them to be free to explore. But, you know, often in the world that we live in today, we, we almost don't want them to explore too much. We're worried about what might happen. You know, one thing I'm really proud of about my, my, my eldest son is that he climbs trees. Um, and very rarely do you see, wherever there's a tree and we go on a walk, he's, he's up it very quickly and uh, waving down from the branches. Um, and there was something in uh, the newspaper last week that said that actually today uh, there's more injuries uh, that they have from young people in terms of their thumbs and their fingers. Um, <coughs> I really don't know how they do it, but somehow they seem to injure their thumbs and their fingers through all the time they spend on screens and keyboards. But the number of injuries that A&E uh, have coming into them from people falling out of trees has very sadly has gone down. Not, it's a sad fact. Not because they're better at climbing trees. They're not. They don't climb them anymore. We don't explore like we may be used to. And with a map, you get to explore. You come to understand what is north and what is south and where is east and west. And you get a bird's eye view. You get to see a bigger picture than just the roundabout immediately in front of you. And so, I'm not really wanting to, you to necessarily go and learn how to read a map, and most of us will carry on using satnavs. But I want to use that analogy to talk about why in our life's journey it's so important for us to, to develop an ability to study God's word, uh, to, to discover the different realms and levels that exist when you have a prayer life. And... Um, when we delve deeper into these two practices in our life, we have in our hands an incredible map that can guide us like nothing else in life. We acquire a profoundly personal map that gives us directions in a way a preacher and a teacher and a parent and the media never can. It's a, like having an internal compass that allows you, that internal compass, allows you to go places only, only God can show you, that only you can really go to when you go with your Father in heaven, your friend, your dear, most deepest friend, God. Now, every Wednesday morning, I sit with a co-worker. Uh, we, we meet at 8.30 and we meet in Pret, just a street away from where we work, and, and we meet to talk about the office and, and to, to say a prayer together. And last week, Robert, this is Robert Haynes, you, some of you know him, uh, he said, let's also read something together. Let's study something together as well, because we, he just felt it would help focus our conversation and we wouldn't get off onto a tangent about something that's nothing to do with work and it's somehow we end up talking about church, and we talk about church enough in life, and it's good to talk about what we meant to talk about, which is work. And, um, and we met, and he brought something to read, and he brought something from John, the book of John. And, um, and I'll just read it to you. It's John 14, 13. And Jesus said, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So Jesus said to his disciples, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And Robert said to me, I, I, he had his Gideon Bible, New Testament and Psalms, and he said to me, because I was looking for something and this seemed to be in the early, at the start of the Gideon Bible, pointing to something 
that might be relevant for our work, but I don't really understand it, he said. And so we went back, and I'll just read you a bit more, and we thought, well, we'll, we'll just look at the context of that verse, and what's happening, and who is Jesus talking to? And uh, if you go to the beginning of John 14, it says Jesus is trying to comfort his disciples. He's trying to explain to them that he's going to be leaving them soon. And he's been their guide, he's been their teacher, and he's been their satnav, you know, <laughs> all the way through. But he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know, that the, you know the way to the place where I am going. And then Thomas says, he's always questioning everything, he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Because you've seen, Jesus is saying, because you've seen me. So he just explained that. And then Philip obviously wasn't listening. Um, so I hope you're, we're all listening today. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. So Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Patiently replying to him, even after I have been among you such a long time, don't you know me? Anyone who has seen me, he says, has seen the Father. And he goes on. And he says, how can you show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And then he gets to this bit again that, I, that we were reading. And he says, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in me. And then we brought that wider context and that specific verse to the context of our work. And we kind of confessed that um, we don't, that when we meet on a Wednesday, we don't often really ask God for something specific for the office. We don't really ask him for something to happen in the office. We don't ask him to, uh, uh, to do something in terms of our relationships in the office, in the terms of the way we work. Uh, in terms of something deeper. So st what we found that studying God's word and bringing it to bear on that particular context of our work brought us into a greater depth and a deeper sense of purpose in terms of what we were going to do for the next, next eight hours. And so when you and I study on our own or study together God's word for a specific con context and a clear purpose, it brings depth and it brings us that big picture. It allows you not just to find the shortest route to, to where you want to go, um, but to find maybe a more scenic, a more beautiful route. Um, it allows you to make wise choices out of the freedom that God has created you with. It helps you which is what I experienced after we read that passage. It helps you to see very quickly when you're going wrong. Because later on that day, because one of the things I wanted God to do was to, to guide me in, in the, the ethics and the, 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 the purpose of what I'm doing in my work. And we're helping people to get money back for things that have been missold to them by banks. And what happened is that I had a case on my desk, a claim that I was doing for a client. Uh, and it was quite a big one. And, but actually, because I had done quite a few of these and we'd done several of them, 
it was quite an easy one to do. And the guy, I, the manager I work with, he said, you know, just hold on to this sign until the end of June. Uh, and because uh, I only brought this client on board at the start of June. And uh, they'd signed a client agreement for a significant percentage of whatever we get them back. And, uh, and so, you know, if we, if we do it just in a week, then it, <laughs> look, it, it looks like it's, you know, we're asking too much, but actually we're, we're not because a lot of work has gone into working out how to do that claim. And so I did it at the end of June. This was last week. I did it on, on, on uh, Tuesday. And then on the next day, I got a phone call from Halifax, from the complaints department, saying, I agree with all your arguments. I'm going to be offering the client £47,000, £578.56. pence." Um, and I'll be writing to you with a check. And I said, no, 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 send the check to them. You prefer it that way. And, and then I called the client up. And I said, I've got some good news. And they're quite elderly. I said, do you maybe want to sit down? Uh, and uh, yeah, we've been able to send off the complaint. And I've had a call back. And, uh, but I, I, before I told them, I said, I've been doing a lot of work on your case this month. And I suddenly thought, what? No, no you, no, you haven't. It's been sitting there on my desk all month. That's no work at all. The file's just been sitting there, and I wrote the complaint in 20 minutes. I haven't been doing a lot of work on their complaint this month. And after I said to the office, I said, I can't believe I just said that. I didn't need to say that. It was a lie. I lied to them. And I went to, a, I'm doing a course, an alpha course at the moment, and, I, and we were sh sharing about evil. There was a talk about evil, and, and, we're to, uh, and how does evil grow in us, and how does it start? And I, I, I kind of confessed sort of to that little incident, because it seems quite little, but it's actually little things like that, if we ignore them, they get bigger. And, uh, and everyone laughed, and they said, that's kind of what happens in sales, and that's, but actually, you know, if we're people of faith, if we believe in a God of goodness, of truth, then those kind of things are wrong. But if we hadn't sat down that morning, Robert and I, and talked about what we want in the office, would I have noticed that? Or would I have just been on sat-nav and, and just been looking straight ahead about getting our commission? So... I realized I'd lied to the client. And you may feel, some of you, I, I, I sometimes feel like this as well, sometimes you may feel that you can get by without God's word in your life, that you already know where you're going. And you feel that you can get by without reading and studying God's word, reading the Bible, divine principle, our true father's words, that, that you can get by without it. You may feel that. But there will come a day when you wish you really had studied. There will come a day when something will come up in your life where you really need some deeper guidance. And unfortunately, I, I think this is true, and it's not to scare us. Unfortunately, if we think we can just dip in to God's word when we really need it, having not taken the time to study it regularly, we'll find that it doesn't really serve us as it could if we had studied it regularly. That we'll find that we read it and it doesn't really penetrate us the way it could if we had studied it over time. You see, a map, if you've ever been hiking or orienteering, a map is not something you can just pick up in the middle of the mountain and and, and use, unless you've learned how to use it, unless you've learned what all those little funny symbols are and what those, those wavy lines are. What are those wavy lines? Oh, it's to show me that I'm really high up or I'm really low down. And it's the same with God's word. That if we study it regularly, it can show us how high up we really are or how low down, actually, we might be.
And when you're completely lost and you're needing a bird's eye view and on, where, and on knowing where to get to, on where you, how to get yourself out of a foggy valley, then you need that ability to catch God's bird's eye view, God's perspective. Because it will bring you so much strength and reassurance if you can open your scripture and be guided by it. And so just lastly, I want to talk about prayer as well. And um, prayer in the same way is like a, a, a profound map that God gives us for our spiritual life. And it opens up a whole new world, eventually, that is exciting and, and it's also challenging. Um, but we have a whole new world of experience through prayer. It means we end up with an internal co compass uh, rather than having to do that thing all the time, you know, that you might have seen someone do in the street when they're trying to calibrate their phone uh, to, to um, tell them which end of Oxford Street. If you ever stood in Oxford Street, uh, I've done this, I've, come, I've been, come out of a shop and I'm thinking, okay, I want to go to West London. Now, is Marble Arch that way or that way? And you look and you think, oh, it must be that. But actually, it's very hard to tell. And that's when you get this out and do that. Okay, anyway, that's just a little tip for the shoppers in the room who might be buying, going to buy some shoes or, you know, or, um, or some, some football boots or something. Anyway, this studying God word is the same with prayer. It's not something that you can simply dip into in a random moment in your life, I don't think, um, and really get the full benefit of it. It's something that if you do regularly, and if you persevere with over time, and make space for in your life, that it will sustain you continuously, but in those really important moments, when things are just going so well or so badly that you really need to be on track in order to not make a silly decision. That if you have been doing it regularly, it will keep you true and safe. Now, just a couple of things about prayer. Um, it's a big subject, but I just wanted to share a couple of things. So one thing is that it's quite normal and there's nothing wrong with starting out a prayer with a request to have an agenda. Like Jesus said, Anything you ask in my name, I'll, I'll give to you. But it's in my name that is the interesting bit. And so yesterday, we were all going to different places. I had to go to work, and I had to take a couple of the kids with me. That, and and Chirka was going somewhere, and Lenny was going somewhere. And Damon was the first to leave the house, and he was going off uh, to a friend's party uh, somewhere called Coral Reef, and they were driving somewhere quite far away. And... I was trying to remember which friend it was. I was like, is this dad the one who works in film? Or, and he didn't know. And, you know, so, gosh, I don't even know his dad. I might be an axe murderer. Um, no, I wasn't thinking that. Um, uh, but, but, you know, I don't know, something about your eldest child, you, you worry more about them than the others, uh, which is why my mother's always worried about me. It's intensely annoying to have your be the eldest. But, um, uh, and he was in a rush, and he was late, and I was saying, you know, let's say a prayer, and I'm a bit late. And, you know, the wisdom got the better of me, and I thought, you don't want to pressurize a teenager into prayer. It just tends to backfire. And so I sort of said, say a prayer on your way. Anyway, as he walked down the road, I said a prayer, and I said, God, I just want you to really keep Damon safe. And, and the interesting thing about prayer is you start off without, with your agenda, and you start to realize that there's a bigger agenda. And I, and I suddenly experienced that feeling that God has towards me, that I was experiencing towards my eldest son. 
And then I asked again, yeah, please keep him safe. And I, because I had a, just had a feeling from God, I realized that, well, you know, I, it's a bit cheap just asking God to keep my son safe. Is it like, you know, God, if they have a car accident, you know, just make sure he's okay, but it doesn't matter what happens to the rest of them. They can all get mangled up and end up in intensive care for all I care. No, that's not the kind of prayer I really think God wants to hear. And I started to realize that it'd be nice to pray for his friends. And I thought, oh, well, if they're his friends, what kind of friend would I like him to be? And so instead of praying for his safety and for him to come back um, without anything stupid or bad having happened, I found myself actually praying that he, my son could be a good friend to his friends. That, you know that they may stay friends for a long time, that they may even become lifelong friends, because those are the friendships that we really want. And so from worrying about something, I found myself seeing a much bigger picture, a much more important picture. So I don't know if you've had that experience with God praying, that you ask for something and he tells you there's something bigger. There was another moment when it was about me and I was praying not even for someone else, just about for myself. And and I was trying to make a decision about whether to stop doing something in my life and start a new season. And I was about 23 and I was doing this mission in our church and I think I'd done it for long enough and I wanted to do something else. I've been selling roses in nightclubs, which, you know, it's a sort of strange church mission. But anyway, there you go. Um, and, uh, And I said to God, you know, I remember standing out there in the car park of our retreat place down in Livingston House saying, God, you know, I, I feel like I'd like to do something else now. What do you reckon? What do you think? And all I heard, what do you think I should do, God? And all I heard God say back to me is, you want to know if you can change what you're doing now? My, my plan for your life is just so much bigger. The picture I have for your life is just so much bigger than that piddly little decision that you're trying to make. Make your decision. And don't worry, I have a, a wonderful big plan for your life. But you make your decision and try to get a sense of what my big plan is for you. And so in a sense, God, again, trying to get us to go deeper than just the the view 500 meters in front of us. You know, we, have, we need to unpack these big words that we have as religious people and turn them into a practical theology. So one word you'll hear time and time again, in, in, not just in religious circles, your pop song writers will write about it and poets will write about it, and you'll hear this word, true love. But you will also find it in re- religious communities. And, and uh, I, I, frankly, when I hear the word true love, it really doesn't mean anything to me. I, that's not too much of a confession. It just uh, sounds like a slogan. Anyone else feel like that? I've just heard the word too many times. You'll have to come up with a new phrase for me. And I don't know about you. But... Uh, If we unpack it, if we take some time to think about it, and rather we just start to think about love in terms of a relationship in our real life, then then it can start to have a greater depth. Um, I should finish, but I just, I don't know, I wanted to share one more thing with you about prayer. Is it... Do you think that's enough? Do you, shall I wrap up, or do you want to hear one more thing about prayer? Yeah? You sure? Well, I know Anne, you know, Anne's very, you know, uh, but how about the rest of you? Do you want, do you, is that enough? Yeah. If it's enough, it's enough, yeah? Huh? You sure? It's about repentance, though. You sure? I mentioned to, I was talking to the, with, uh, Peter, who, who's leading our service today, and I was talking, I wanted to mention something about an aspect of prayer, as, such as repentance, and he said, and he was right, and we had this discussion about how 
repentance maybe in our unification movement has become something like, like you don't really want to touch. It's like, um, I don't know if it's because we come from, as a movement, a little bit from the Orient and there's not necessarily that uh, organic sense of forgiveness that we find uh, at the heart of Christianity and that sometimes when you've done something wrong, it's just about not to do it anymore and it's not really, saying sorry doesn't really make any difference. It's just like, you should feel bad. You know, that's the most important thing. I don't know if you've ever felt like that. Um, but, uh, but actually, repentance is not about that. Repentance is actually about forgiveness. It's about being free from what might make you feel bad. It's about being liberated by changing. When we change and we feel sorry, we feel free and uh, we feel light and good. And, uh, and, and, pr- and when, if prayer is going to be an important part of this map that you have for your life, then I just thought I'd touch briefly on this point about repentance because make it a part of your prayers. And um, because the whole idea of in Christianity we get about repentance is that Jesus went a course in order to overcome evil, that he could, we could be forgiven for the evil things that we do and we could be liberated from the clasp of the devil. We could be freed from the clasp of evil in this world. So I just thought I'd ask you, and just you don't have to put your hand up because it's not. How many of you, uh, when you pray, spend to take spend a bit of time, take a bit of time to say sorry? Yeah, you don't have to put your hand up. Just uh, how many of you uh, take? How, or, how big a thing is that for you? You know, often uh, in public prayers we will say, you know. Heavenly Father, please forgive us all for uh, the way we've come short and the, the things that we've all done wrong and uh, that have blocked us from being with you. And then we take that very collective approach to sin and to what we've done wrong into our private prayer. And I don't know if you've done this. I've done this and I've said, Heavenly Father, I'm really sorry uh, for the things I've done wrong today or I'll, I'll pray this at night with the boys. We're sorry for the things we've done wrong today. But actually it's a bit of a cop-out, Yeah just to lump all the things that we've done wrong together. You know, if I've robbed uh, Marshall and I've, I've also driven into the back of his car and I've cheated him and lied to him and, and uh, I've talked behind his back and, and he's found out all these things and I just come up to him, I'm really sorry about all those things I've done. And just lump them all together like that. Please forgive me. You know, it's hard. Yeah, and, and it's kind of... I've kind of missed the point a bit. Yeah? The point about saying sorry is that I want to change. So if I just lump it all together, it's going to be much harder for me to change. And uh, I just read something. I'm reading a book called Too Busy Not to Pray. And it's by Bill Heibel. He's, uh, uh, I, I guess, other than Rick Warren, probably uh, the most influential pastor, uh, one of the most influential pastors in America. And, and he wrote this book, and he starts off saying actually about how for him prayer is a, a not, um, not a particularly easy thing, or wasn't an easy thing, it wasn't something that was very deep in his life. But he said, as he's obviously got deeper into prayer, when you have the courage to call your sins by their true natures, several wonderful things fall into place. He says, um, conf- he says I determined a long time ago that in my prayers... I would deal with sin, things that go against God, specifically. I would say, and this is a great pastor one, or a great uh, Unification Church movement one, I told so-and-so we had 900 people at the event, but I know that there weren't more than 500. (laughs) Um, That was a lie, and therefore I am a liar. And I plead for your forgiveness for being a liar. Or instead, he says, I, I admitted, or I, instead of admitting I've been less than the best husband, I would say to God, today I willfully determined to be self-centered, uncaring and insensitive. It was a calculated decision, he admits. 
I walked through the door thinking, I'm not going to serve her tonight. I've had a harsh day and I deserve to have things my way. I need your forgiveness for the sin of selfishness. And so how often when we say sorry in our prayers, do we go into that much detail? Yeah. But actually if we do that, it makes an enormous difference. He says, um, yeah, um, when you have the courage to call your sins by their true name, several wonderful things fall into place. Your conscience will be cleansed. I, fe- I finally said it, you will think. I'm finally getting honest with God. I'm not playing games anymore, and it feels good. And you'll feel flooded with relief and, and something new growing in you. So I don't know about what I've shared about my prayers or about his prayer. I don't know if that resonated with you or not. But what I just want to say in conclusion is that um, if you can catch this concept of not living a sat-nav type of lifestyle, a linear being directed by someone else lifestyle, but, but really seek through studying God's word and prayer, a much more profound journey in life. You know, when I was young and before I got to really have God enter into my life and for me to be conscious of his presence, I felt very lost about where I was and where I wanted to get to and how I would get there. But when God came into my life and I started to study and I started to pray, I experienced an enormous sense of direction and purpose that I had never felt before. And if I'm honest, from time to time, that has waned and that has started to disappear from my life. And it's disappeared when I've stopped to study and I've stopped to pray. And I know some of you have also felt that sometimes it's been like that for you. And recently, I've been reading some of the early sermons from our founder, Reverend Moon, from the 50s. If you go to unification.net, you can click on the different years and on the different sermons. And if you read those prayers, you can learn a lot about prayer and relationship with God and about the tension that can exist within our life from having this vision and hope for a new world and at the same time dealing with the often very complicated, difficult reality of our own lives. But that tension, I think, is what really spurred his uh, mission and his movement to grow and flourish. So allow yourself to discover that tension. And if we are going to build home churches, we're going to need to learn how to study on our own and study together and pray on our own and pray together. So we have some time now to pray together as a community. So if you're here for the first time, this is the time in the service where we just find somebody to pray with. Uh, If you don't know anyone, um, you can just look for someone who looks friendly. Um, um, But if you you just want to pray on your own, that's okay. But those of you who feel like you'd like to uh, give the blessing of prayer to someone else in the room, really I encourage you to find someone to pray for in the room this morning. And... um, uh, the band's going to come up and uh, we're, we'll have some worship music from them to support our prayer and just pray that in this moment uh, you can feel God's Holy Spirit in your heart fill you up for, a week, for the week ahead. So shall we just pray together and then please find somebody to pray with. Just, you can just stay as you are. You don't have to go anywhere right now, but... Just sit as you are and let's pray. Loving Father, we come together now to pray with each other and to pray to you, to draw down your Holy Spirit into our lives, to feel the grace and the blessing that is open to our lives when when we really call upon your name and we call upon your love. We pray that each precious brother and sister here can feel the love that you have for them as as 
Beth father. They can feel that they really are your child. And the love that, that parental love that you have for them. Heavenly Father, we pray that the things that we pray over each other this morning can be powerful and life-changing. I report these things and we want to pray together now. Let's pray together. And if you want to find someone to pray with, please do. <laughs> so we pray together.
So now we'll have our offering song, If Life Were Gracious Enough. Precious Heavenly Parent, we thank you so much for all the blessing you have granted upon us this week, the last month, and so many times. And now we would like to share some of the of it with you. We offer our tithing, our donations. I know it's not much, but. We really wish to offer it for your providence that you can bless it and bless the hand who will use it and give them, give those in charge the wisdom to use it appropriately and that you can bless all this to bring even more food in the future. We thank you so much for that. In the name of Anne from the Kota Bless family owner of Chonigu Gajo. Thank you, Anne. Please be seated, everybody. Okay, that concludes our service. And uh, I'd like to remind you that um, uh, there's lunch downstairs. I believe it's chicken. And, um, yeah, it's just £2.50 for adults with dessert. So if you, if you want to support the, the, uh, some of the young, adult, young people in our ministry going to America to learn from carp and then bring that wisdom back here and, and also apply it here, then, yeah, you can please pay 50p or a pound more. I think I can go up to three pounds myself, <laughs> maybe four. So God bless you and have a great week. Thank, Thank you. you. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King of glory.
Lucius. 